Hi, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, today we're going to talk about head and neck cancer. It's obviously a very uh, big topic and a, a huge amount of material to try to cover in a short period of time. So we're going to look at a couple of aspects of head and neck tumor in specific and see how we can apply them kind of to different parts and how we think about head and neck cancer. Uh, so I have nothing significant to disclose. Uh, I have a uh, head and neck tumor board that we usually have every Friday uh, where we review all the head and neck cases. So this is just kind of my deep thoughts on, on head and neck cancer. So we'll look at the important imaging anatomy that we think about with cancer patients. We'll review some of the spread patterns and we'll mostly take a quick look at nodal and perineural tumor spread and see how this affects patient care and management. Now, for a lot of head and neck cancer, we're talking about squamous cell carcinoma. That's far and away the most common head and neck cancer that we think about. There are other types of tumors, nerve sheath tumors, minor salivary gland carcinomas, there are other things. But when we talk in a big picture about head and neck cancer, we're most frequently talking about squamous cell carcinoma. And we have issues with anatomy everywhere with the upper digestive tract. Uh, we talk about our staging systems and we look for lymph nodes and perineal tumor spread around all this anatomy. So uh, actually about, depending on your practice, 90% or more of all the head and neck cancer you see is probably squamous cell carcinoma. And we used to spend a lot of time talking about the different grades. Is it well differentiated, moderately differentiated, or poorly differentiated, thinking that that would affect therapy, but we don't talk about that as much anymore in, in terms of changing or increasing uh, chemotherapy, chemoradiation, or other therapies in that sense. And cancer itself is one huge uh, issue. We have all these issues with epidemiology, and uh, there's cancer uh, genes, and we look at a lot of different ways to diagnose, and the pathology is its own big discussion. So I'm going to focus, obviously, on, on the imaging and what we see in our cases uh, normally during the day. So some of our latest statistics, somewhere around 4% of all cancers in the US are head and neck cancers. Uh, we expect somewhere around 65,000 new cases a year. And interestingly, see it's about twice as many men as it is women. And it's estimated somewhere between 14,000 and 15,000 deaths will happen in 2020 due to head and neck cancer. And again, you see those statistics are not very good for men three times as many head and neck cancer deaths happen in men than happen in women. Now, overall, the incidence of cancers we think about is kind of decreasing over time. So the incidence, if we look at all the different races, they've uh, almost all been decreasing in terms of their incidence and the mortality actually has been decreasing. So we're, we are getting better at treating these, especially at African-Americans and our therapies and how we treat these patients. Uh, these are very aggressive tumors, though, and frequently patients get a second tumor. It's kind of an odd thing the way we think about it, and there's some kind of annual rate. If you think about the environmental exposures and the genetic predisposition that patients have to get that cancer, there's always a chance they could get another cancer in the future. So if somebody gets a cancer, even at a particular spot, and they get another cancer of the same type in the same spot 10 or 15 years later, we think about that as a second primary, not as a recurrence of the original tumor. That's kind of an odd way to think about cancer. And uh, we know that those new cancers are very frequently show up along the upper digestive tract or the lungs somewhere. So those are the areas obviously that we're looking at very closely in those cases. So there's a lot of risk factors, smoking tobacco and chewing tobacco as well as alcohol. Uh, but viruses is a new discussion. We've been having a lot more just in the past five or 10 years that's really changed how we think about head and neck cancer. Now, uh, everything that we do, we talk about the AJCC staging classification. And uh, we come up, so at every Friday of my tumor board, we all discuss the patient. I talk about imaging, the pathologist talks about the path, the surgeons and the radiation oncologists and the chemo guys all talk about their clinical evaluation. And together we come up with the TNM stage. I personally don't think it's so important to put a radiologic TNM stage in every report, uh, especially because sometimes I don't know all the clinical factors that may change the TNM staging. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And we know that prognosis correlates with that staging that we talk about. If somebody's a low stage, stage one, 
disease survival is greater than 80%, so that's very good. The problem is that stage three and four is very bad. It's less than half. And patients are usually already stage three or four when they present. So when patients show up, they're more frequently at a higher stage. People can ignore pathology for a long time before they go see a doctor, it turns out. So every time I think about a head and neck cancer, whether it's squamous cell carcinoma or anything else, I think about three big things, and I want to include this in my report. I talk about the primary site. Where is the lesion centered? And that's very important for staging, because when we think about all the different places that the tumor may be centered, that has a very different implication for the TNM staging. I look for lymph nodes, and I think about perineural tumor spread. So for every case I have, I want to think about those three things in the report. Now, in terms of TNM staging, I will say, if you read my impression, I'm going to say everything in there that you need to understand to interpret what a radiologic TNM stage would be. There's a tumor centered at this location. It's, it's this big. It crosses midline. It invades bone. It invades muscle. I look for lymph nodes and describe where they are, how big they are. Are they on both sides or one side? And I look for perineal tumor spread. So I'm going to think about those three big things every time I'm looking at a head and neck cancer case. Now, we're, we're generally talking about the upper digestive tract. So we have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the hypopharynx as we kind of fillet open the upper digestive tract. And this anatomy is very confusing. It turns out we have all these little parts in the upper digestive tract. And each of these subunits, these parts, has very different anatomy. And you can get into great detail about all these little areas. You, you could spend an hour just talking about each one of these little places. But it turns out it's very important because if you say the tumor is centered right here, they may get very different treatment and therapy than if the tumor is centered right here. That's a big deal and we think about this. So we wanna always think about where the center of that lesion is. Where did this arise from is one of our first things that we think about in all these cases. So when we think about the upper digestive tract, we have these relatively well-defined subunits nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oral cavity, oropharynx, larynx, hypopharynx, and then the trachea and the esophagus. And when we do our soft tissue neck studies and we think about head and neck imaging, we know that we have to go down to the mediastinum. So we end up sometimes following down the trachea and we look for precarinal and subcarinal nodes, AP window nodes in that area. So we, we don't wanna be afraid kind of of the thoracic inlet and that complicated anatomy that's up there at that level, because that's the normal drainage route, especially when we talk about nodes. Squamous cell carcinoma, before the patient has had surgery, chemo, radiation, anything else, squamous cell carcinomas are almost always gonna drain down and towards the heart. Now there's some other pathology like differentiated thyroid carcinoma that may not follow those rules. Differentiated thyroid carcinoma may present with a high retropharyngeal lymph node. But squames, if you haven't had surgery or anything else, they normally drain down and towards the heart in a relatively predictable nodal drainage pattern. That's important for us to remember. So we're thinking about what's outlined here in blue, usually with squamous cell carcinomas. We have skin squames and we have upper, digest, uh, upper digestive tract squames that may arise there. So the pharyngeal mucosal surface or space as one of the spaces that we think about in the superhighway neck, that's really where squames live. There is some minor salivary gland tissue, so we can get minor salivary gland carcinomas every now and then, and they may look just like a squamous cell carcinoma, but it's usually squam that we're looking at. So if you think about something like this axial T1 pre-contrast image, uh, that's outlined the pharyngeal mucosal surface or space. That's where we're thinking about upper air digestive tract squames arising from. So we have skin and upper air digestive. Now with skin, we may be more interested in perineal tumor spread and focus on that, unless it's like melanoma, then we may look for nodes very carefully. But with upper digestive tract, we're more frequently talking about nodes than we are with perineal tumor spread. But we look for both with squames from the skin or the upper digestive tract. So I have a couple of cases that are gonna kind of highlight issues in general, how we think about tumors of different areas. And we'll go through these cases and see how they affect management and what we think about on the imaging side and the imaging process. So this patient comes in kind of with a neck mass. 
and we're looking at the case. Now for us in neuro, symmetry is a huge thing. So things that are bilateral and things that are midline are often hardest for us. But where there's air and where there's fat is very important for these. So if we're doing a soft tissue neck CT, you wanna start off with a window something like 440 so that air is different than fat because where there's air and where there's fat is very important at evaluating these cases. So we look at all these important structures around here, the SCM, the jug, the carotid, and we know the lymph nodes are associated with this area. So sometimes we see little nodes around there. On this side, we see some big nodes and it looks like they have these necrotic foci in it. It's this low density. It doesn't quite approach zero for fluid for Hounsfield unit for density, but it's like 20 Hounsfield units. And we think about that as this mucoid deposition. Sometimes it's just uh, debris, uh, but fluid, uh, but sometimes it's live viable tumor or dead macrophages as it's trying to kill the tumor in that area. So we look for these low density and nodal conglomerate masses that we think about as necrotic foci, sometimes called cystic foci within lymph nodes at that area. So uh, we have this patient and it looks like sure enough, we see a bunch of nodes here. So this is the idea of sometimes what we talk about uh, with a bunch of obvious pathologic lymph nodes, but no obvious primary. The idea of CUP, C-U-P, or, or carcinoma of unknown primary. I see a bunch of lymph nodes, but I don't know where those nodes came from or how they got there. That's very important in terms of their drainage. So what, what next step and what might we do for this? We know that a lot of these patients get distant Mets. And when they show up, somewhere around 10% of patients may already have chest metastatic disease. So if you're not doing a CT of the neck and chest together, we probably want to at least try to do a PET CT of the whole body. And PET CT is great because you get the anatomy with CT and the biophysical properties with PET. And you can see that there is actually a little tumor here in this tonsil, which was kind of hidden just on the CT. It wasn't as obvious. The nodes were much more impressive than the primary tumor. That's something that we sometimes see, especially with HPV positive oral pharyngeal cases. So the, in this case, the PET CT was very helpful because it showed us where the primary tumor actually was. And it also showed us those big nodal conglomerate mass, masses to kind of confirm that tumor at that site. And on the coronal, sure enough, we saw that there were actually several nodes going down the neck and that jugular chain. So we have a chain of lymph nodes that goes down the internal jugular a chain, internal jugular vein in your neck. That's the internal jugular chain of lymph nodes. So when, when we think about this, we're thinking about all this anatomy. So this anatomy here is the oropharynx, very complicated area kind of deep in the back of your throat. So nasal cavity up here, nasal pharynx up here, oral cavity here, and oropharynx back here. Uh, so this anatomy of the oropharynx is very complicated, a little tricky to figure out. If you just look in the mouth, and you see that little uvula hanging down, you've got anterior and posterior arches where we think about those palatine or fascial tonsils kind of in between. So there's an anterior arch and a posterior arch. That's just a mucosal fold over a muscle. So this muscle in the front is going from the palate down to the tongue, so that's palatoglossus. And the one in back is going from the palate down to the pharynx, so that's palatopharyngeus. That's the anterior and posterior tonsillar pillar. And in between those, we think about the palatine or fascial tonsils at that site. But it's very different when we think about how the surgeon is looking in the mouth at that anatomy from what we're thinking about on cross-sectional imaging. So if we think about the oral cavity, all this stuff in blue is behind that. So oral cavity, the tongue up here, the circumvillate papillae, those little big bumps on the back of the tongue, behind that is gonna be the lingual adenoidal tissue or the base of the tongue. And then we have that palatine or fascial tonsil, and then we have the back wall. So here's our anterior and posterior tonsillar pillar. So this anterior pillar is a mucosal fold over a muscle. That muscle goes from the palate to the tongue, so that's palatoglossus. And this one goes from the palate to the pharynx, so that's palatopharyngeus. And in between is that palatine or fascial tonsil. So the base of tongue and the palatine or fascial tonsil and the nasopharyngeal adenoidal tissue up high that together makes Waldeyer's ring, but anatomically, we often think about it as different areas. But all of those count as part of the oropharynx. It's behind the oral cavity, and it's above the hypopharynx back here and the larynx in the front. That's a very complicated anatomy around that area to try to figure out. 
So when we look at our case, we see this increased uptake there in that palatine tonsil and we see nodes on that side. So we think this is a tonsillar oropharyngeal squame at that level. So if I have a tumor at the base of the tongue or the lingual adenoidal tissue, I'm gonna say it's centered there. So this is a base of tongue squame. And I'm gonna think about where that might spread. Does that go anteriorly into the oral cavity? You know, does it go laterally into the deep spaces of the neck? Does it cross midline, maybe the other side? That's very important because then I'm gonna be more suspicious of the lymph nodes on the other side. Or does it go down towards the larynx and the preepiglottic fat and invade that area? I wanna be sure I tell the surgeons all that information when they're thinking about surgical options and how to resect this lesion. And we can also see that pretty well on MR. So here's a sagittal T1 at midline without contrast. If the nose is dark, remember the nose nose, so that's before contrast. So there's the lingual adenoidal tissue or the base of tongue kind of in the back. We include the soft palate and the uvula as part of the oral pharynx. And then we have that back wall, the posterior wall. So those are our subunits of the oral pharynx at that level. Now it turns out that the soft palate right there has a very high concentration of minor salivary gland tissue. So we can get minor salivary gland carcinomas happening there, but still squamous cell carcinoma is far and away the most common head and neck cancer that we see. And we talk about the stage. So I'm gonna measure it in whatever dimension that thing is biggest. Uh, so for the oral cavity and oral pharynx, it's a little easier. You remember the numbers two and four. Is it less than two? Is it between two and four? Is it greater than four for that staging, T1, T2, T3? So is it a little tumor that's less than two centimeters? That's a T1. If it's bigger than two centimeters, you know, three centimeters or so, that's gonna be a T2. If it's over four centimeters in size, that's gonna be a T3. Maybe it's invading down into that preepiglottic fat. Maybe it's invading anteriorly into the tongue past those circumvillae papillae and that area. And if it goes back and is invading the mandible, the pterygoid muscles or something like that, that's automatically a T4A. And then we have this anatomy in the back. If it's wrapping around the carotid, that's automatically a T4B, that's the highest stage. And we talked before about the deep spaces. We talked about the prevertebral fascia that goes here in front of the vertebral bodies. To the surgeons, that's called the carpet, kind of the floor. And if the tumor invades the floor, that's automatically also a T4B in that area. That's a very hard area to evaluate. We might think about doing a barium swallow to see if the pharynx moves up and down or if it's fixed right there at that level uh, to try to figure out if the carpet is invaded. That's not easy to tell, but it's a big change in management because he may not be a very good surgical candidate if it's already invaded the prevertebral fascia or if it's gone up and invaded the skull base at that level. So we, we mentioned lymph nodes. So we have these different chains. There's an internal jugular chain. Uh, there's the spinal accessory chain going down and there's the transverse cervical chain that kind of makes a triangle of chains in your neck. But again, squames have a relatively predictable pattern. They're going down and towards the heart of the neck. And when you think about it, we spend a lot of time talking about the primary tumor, but it turns out that the single most important prognostic factor when you think about head and neck cancer and squamous cell carcinoma, it's not the primary site. It's not even how big the primary tumor is or the differentiation. Is it moderately differentiated poorly or you know, what kind of differentiate? It turns out that's not as important as the lymph nodes. It turns out the presence and number of pathologic nodes is the single most important prognostic factor with head and neck cancer. And most patients with head and neck cancer already have metastatic disease when they show up, when they're diagnosed. Uh, almost half the time, there is a lymph node that's pathologic somewhere on that imaging study. And again, about 10% have distant mets. So that's why it's important to think about the chest. And if you're not doing a CT of the neck and the chest, doing a PET CT kind of of the whole body helps you find those 10 to 15% of the cases that may have distant mets in different areas. And the presence of nodal mets actually cuts your prognosis in half. That decreases your survival by 50%. So when you have a head and neck cancer patient show up, Almost half of those patients have at least one pathologic node somewhere on that imaging study. And if you find a definite pathologic node, you just cut his prognosis in half. That's very important. And the presence of nodal METs doubles the incidence of distant METs. So it's even more likely that there's distant disease in the chest or somewhere else. 
How about extranodal spread? We sometimes talk about the lymph node itself and has tumor extended beyond the lymph node. Well, it turns out that's also very important. If you see extranodal spread, and we know we're not very good at telling it with HPV oral pharyngeal cases, but if you do see what looks like fuzziness around a lymph node, like the cancer has escaped the node, that cuts the prognosis by half again. That's very important. It also increases the risk of recurrence by 10 times. If you imagine metastatic disease that's left the lymphatic system, it's just crawling around the neck soft tissues, recurrence is going to be more likely. And it increases the risk of distant mets by three times. So when we think about that little cancer cell that's going in kind of the afferent limb of that lymph node, and the node itself is the, has these little chambers where the immune system is mediated, I want to think all the time, is that cancer cell going to stop in that lymph node or is it going to pass right on through to the next lymph node in the chain? So do you think drainage routes are important? They're very important. Why would you even ask a question like that? It draws attention to regions of likely spread in these cases. There's actually four big reasons why drainage routes are important in cancer. So the first one is they draw attention to regions of likely spread. So just like in our case, if I have a tumor at a certain location, I'm gonna think about what lymph nodes drain that area, and I'm gonna pay a lot of attention to that area. So I know that base of tongue and palatine tonsil nodes often go to level two. So that's important. I'm gonna be more suspicious of those nodes. If the tumor looks like it crosses midline, I might be more suspicious of nodes on the contralateral side. So that's also very important. Now the opposite is also true, just like in our case, if we have a bunch of lymph nodes, but no obvious primary, we can kind of think backwards. What primary site drains to these lymph nodes? So if I have an obvious pathologic level two node, anytime we have a cystic mass at the angle of the mandible and somebody is over 40 or so, we want to think first squame node. And if I have a cystic node here, a necrotic node, I'm going to think about the palatine tonsil in the base of the tongue, because that's the most likely site of the primary tumor that's going to drain to that area. So this is another base of tongue or lingual adenoidal tissue with a pathologic level two node. Now borderline suspicious nodes elsewhere may be less suspicious if that lymphatic drainage doesn't quite make sense. So if I have a hypopharyngeal squame, if I have a squame centered in the hypopharynx, kind of behind the cricoid, so down kind of low, but I have a lymph node that's up high, like under the mandible, that lymphatic drainage doesn't quite make sense. Now, if he's had a lot of surgery and radiation to his lower neck and that lymphatic drainage is not working properly, then the lymphatics may go up and around. But if this has never been treated, I know that those nodes are gonna drain down and towards the heart. So a lymph node up high is gonna be less suspicious in that case. Now, the fourth and last reason that drainage is important is because other re regions of lymph nodes might suggest to you a second primary. So if I have a palatine tonsil squame, this one looks pretty solid, and I have a pathologic node on that side, and this thing does not cross midline. If I have an obvious pathologic node on the other side, that doesn't quite make sense in this lymphatic drainage. So this is gonna make me think that there might be a second primary somewhere else. And we sometimes call these lymph nodes that are low left supraglavicular fossa a signal node or vercow, if you like to name stuff after dead people, and that it may be signaling a primary below the clavicles in the chest or abdomen. So anytime I see a big pathologic node in the left supraclavicular fossa, a signal or a vercow node, I know that that node may be signaling a primary in the chest or abdomen. So I'm gonna do a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis to try to find that because this lymph node does not make sense as drainage from this primary on the contralateral side. So we also know that with lymph nodes, you have a worse prognosis with the greater number of nodes involved, the more nodal chains. If it's bilateral, that's worse. And the lower in the neck, the closer to the heart, the lymph nodes are, the worse the prognosis is. So we know that lymph nodes are very important in head and neck cancer. Now, how we evaluate these cases is also very important. Now, whether you're comfortable with a CT or an MRI, just get familiar with that anatomy. But it's very important, if you're doing a CT, start off with that window level, something like 440, so that air is different than fat. And if you're doing an MR, 
do not ignore the T1 before contrast and don't do fat saturation before contrast on the T1. Don't do it. Where that fat is, is very important. If you pay attention to where fat is supposed to be, it helps you with a lot of these pathologies. So this is a big nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So we think about the nasopharynx as a location. This is at torus tuberius. In front of it is eustachian tube opening. Behind it is the lateral pharyngeal recess or Fossa rosenmuller, if you like to name stuff after dead people. Now at the bottom of that lateral pharyngeal recess, that's where nasopharyngeal carcinomas like to start. So this is a good lesion centered in the bottom of that lateral pharyngeal recess. Now there isn't a really good fascial boundary between the bottom of that and the parapharyngeal fat that's right next to it. So it makes sense that nasopharyngeal carcinomas invade that parapharyngeal fat first usually. They go right into that area. But nasopharyngeal carcinomas have different routes of spread. It can go directly right up into the skull base. And we think about them kind of under the frame and lacerum, not really a, a, a hole in the skull base, but very thin cartilage near the horizontal segment of the carotid on both sides. The tumor may go right up through that bone. We may have perineural extension. So perineural tumor spread is very important with nasopharyngeal carcinomas. And you can have all kinds of other spread. We talk about peri, perineural a lot, but you can have perifascial spread, perimuscular spread, transosseous spread, dermal spread along the skin. There's a lot of different types of spread. And some tumors like paragangliomas of the jugular foramen may get into the jugular vein and crawl right down the jugular vein and the neck with an intravenous thrombus of tumor. So we think about these different cases. So here's one after contrast. Now we think about where the trigeminal cistern is or Meckel's cave. Uh, a pie, and this tumor looks like it's invaded that at that level. And we think about the petrous apex and the central skull base, the basi sphenoid and clivus at that location. And we try to figure out if that's invaded by tumor because that's very important for the staging, obviously. So here's another T1 before contrast. This one looks like it's surrounding the carotid. And we look for retropharyngeal nodes. These little lymph nodes that are snuggled up in between the longus capitis and the carotid and the jug on that side. That's where retropharyngeal lymph nodes are. It turns out it's very hard to palpate retropharyngeal nodes. So it's my job to tell them if this is here or not. And again, even if this tumor is centered on this side, if it crosses midline, I'm gonna be more suspicious of lymph nodes on the other side. Uh, here's another case before contrast. Uh, so fat is bright, the nose is dark. Remember the nose nose, so this is before contrast. And I see some bright normal looking marrow over here on this side, but on this side, I've lost the bright marrow. Now this can be confusing, especially if you don't do fat saturation after contrast. This petrous apex, if it's enhancing, it might look just like this one, that's just fat. But if you look at the images before contrast, you see that you've lost the fat over here. You've lost the fat in the central skull base. So this tumor has invaded the skull base. So that's a much higher stage for that lesion. Those, uh, those nasopharyngeal carcinomas may be clinically known or silent, and they can be very invasive as they go into these deep spaces of the neck. And again, it has a big differential. We might think about lymphoma or some other minor salivary gland carcinoma, but usually it's squamous cell carcinoma. And squames of the nasopharynx, we give a special name. We call them nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It kind of reminds us that these squames, when they arise from the nasopharynx, they're very chemoradiation sensitive. Uh, so we often reserve surgery for very bulky disease or recurrence in those cases. Now, just like we talked about around the oral cavity or oral pharynx, we talk about how big it is in whatever plane. So if it's small, that's a T1. If it's going out laterally, kind of into that parapharyngeal fat, it's a higher stage. If it is invading the skull base, automatically a T3. And if it's going through the skull base, it's automatically a T4. So we talk about where the thing is centered and we talk about where it goes. Does it invade bone? Does it cross midline? What is the farthest away from the center that the lesion goes? That tells us the T stage of those cases. Uh, so we, we can see little tiny cases. This is a, a very small case. It's even hard to see where it is, but it was crawling along, invading the opposite longus capitis, and we had a big retropharyngeal node we see here after contrast in that case. Here's another case, if it's much larger and in that parapharyngeal fat on this T1 after contrast image with fat saturation, 
that's automatically going to be a T2. If it uh, goes there over there, we're going to look at the carotid and the jug very closely. This is a T2, CSF is bright. We see a lot of fluid in those mastoids, so we know we're mechanically blocking the eustachian tube. We know where that eustachian tube goes and dumps just in front of the torus tuberius, that bump in the nasopharynx. Uh, so the T2 is good like the ADC as a rough marker of tumor cellularity. Things that are very hypercellular like lymphoma are often dark on the T2. And we do CTs. Anytime something is around the skull base, we don't feel bad about ordering the other one because we know they're complementary. If we have a CT, we order an MR with contrast. And if we have an MR with contrast, we often order a CT because we know they're complementary and we can sometimes tell you exactly what the stage is and sometimes the pathology, depending on where the lesion is centered. So here's an axial CT and we see how we've destroyed the bone there around the horizontal segment of the carotid. And we're going right up into the pterygoid or vidian canal at that level. So here's that pterygoid or vidian canal at this side near the ovale and spinosum at that location. So we're destroying the bone at that side. So if we're into the skull base, that's automatically a T3 at that level. And if it goes intracranially, we're thinking that's probably already a T4. We see here how this skull base is invaded. Again, we've lost the fat on this T1 before contrast. We should have bright fat like we see on this side. So don't ignore the T1 images. They're often very helpful. Now, if it goes up intracranially, that's automatically a T4. So here's a big lesion and you see a very big ovale on that side. So here's a more normal looking uh, V3 going through a valley. The nerve should not enhance. This is V3 right here. If you ever want to find V3, find your condylar head, go to the medial part, go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior. That's where V3 is at ovale. It's easier to find ovale on CT. It's harder on MR, but that's a little trick to help find it. So just medial to the lateral pterygoid, we see V3. The nerve should not enhance, but there's often enhancement around it because there's this pterygoid venous plexus, a common pseudomass at that location. So we have a big tumor at this side and it's crawling up V3 right through a valley to get to the trigeminal cistern or Mecco's cave. And it could go forward to the cavernous sinus from there or back towards the pons and the brainstem at that location. Now, a lot of those patients, some people say up to 90% of nasopharyngeal carcinomas already have pathologic lymph nodes when they show up at presentation. And about half the time they're bilateral. We think about the very dense lymphatic plexus and the superhighway neck that's in that retropharyngeal space. So we look for those retropharyngeal nodes as the first nodal order drainage station of the nasopharynx, also sometimes the oropharynx and hypopharynx. Uh, so that brings us to perineal tumor spread. So that case had tumor that was crawling up V3 along five. So along the fifth cranial nerve where V3 is going down through a valley from the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave, V1 and 2 are going forward to the cavernous sinus. So contrasted MR is really best to evaluate perineal tumor spread. It is better than contrasted CT, which is better than PET, which is better than ultrasound. And, and we've got somewhere around a 93% positivity, uh, sensitivity to fine perineal tumor spread. The trick here is that anytime somebody has an isolated cranial nerve deficit, we want to think about imaging from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. Normally that means starting behind the pontomedullary junction and going out through the face. You've, you, you've covered the area of interest. So always image from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. We look for enlarged foramen, we look for loss of the fat pad. We want all of those foramen of the skull base to have a good fat pad under them. We look for enhancement and we remember the idea of radiologic skip lesions. Because the vascular supply along lymph nodes may be variable, some part may be enhancing, then not enhancing, and then more enhancing. But when they do surgery, it's tumor, 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 all the way along the course of the nerve. So just because part of it looks like it's not enhancing, remember that anatomy, whichever nerve it is, and keep following all the way along the course of the nerve to evaluate for perineal tumor spread. With perineal tumor spread, we seem to see it most on V2, cranial nerve V2, more than V3, more than V1, and then the facial nerve is the most likely in my practice when I look for it. So I want to be very familiar with those nerves. If somebody has a little squamous cell carcinoma or a, a, a pathology lesion on the skin of the eyebrow, for example, I remember where V1 comes out uh, over the eyeball and I'm going to look very closely to see if there's abnormal enhancement along that course. 
that might be perineural tumor spread. Uh, and on the coronal MR, it's very nice to see these rectus muscles. And here's this extra ball of enhancement sitting on top of the superior oblique. Remember asymmetry, you often have your own internal standard. So you can compare with the other side and see which side looks asymmetric. That can be hard, especially with things like denervation of the tongue. It might look like the other side is abnormal with a mass, but it's really just that that side is denervated. So the other side is doing all the work. Uh, so with perineal tumor spread, for example, if you had a lesion on your cheek, it can get on that V2 division under the orbit back to the pterygopalatine fossa and may get back to the trigeminal cistern and keep crawling along five to get back intracranially at that site. So this deep part, that spread, is hard to palpate. So it's my job to tell the surgeons if it's there. And perineural tumor spread is kind of the head and neck imager's shtick. We don't really talk about perineural tumor spread with liver cancer or something else. Maybe with prostate if you're doing special prostate imaging. But really outside of the head and neck, you really don't talk about perineural tumor spread very much. So if a patient has tumor, just like in that graphic, it's going along rotundum, it's in the cavernous sinus, it's in the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. And if it's going back and touching the pons, he's probably not a very good surgical candidate. So doing a big surgery on this guy may just be increasing his M&M. &M. It might be making it worse in this case. So this is my job to tell them when they're looking at the tip of the iceberg, how deep the iceberg goes towards the brain. Now we also think about that with the seventh cranial nerve. So all those branches of the facial nerve as it goes out through the face, if we have a tumor in the parotid, especially adenoid cystic, which really likes perineural tumor spread, the tumor can go distal or go proximal up the descending mastoid segment. So if I see abnormal enhancement in the internal auditory canal and I can follow it down the descending or mastoid segment, I want to think about, is there actually a tumor in the parotid? And this is perineural tumor spread that's going all the way up here, because that's a big deal for management of this patient. We want to differentiate a herpetic or a Bell's palsy when the fascia is not moving from perineural tumor spread, very different therapies and treatments. So moving on to our next case. So just as we saw earlier, if I have a big lesion there in the base of tongue and I have a big node at that location, that's a big deal. But we have this new switch that just happened with the new version of the AJCC and how we stage these patients. So this is a base of tongue or a lingual adenoidal tumor. And this is what we usually think about with virgin untreated squames of the upper digestive tract. This is a high density exophytic mass. And just like when you're doing head CTs and you think about narrowing the window to 30, 30 or something like that to see gray white differentiation, we can actually do the same thing in the cervical soft tissues. If I narrow this window to 30, 30, it exaggerates hypercellularity. So it might make it easier to see head and neck cancer on soft tissue neck CTs in those cases. So this is a base of tongue lesion. So I'm remembering the numbers two and four. Is this over two centimeters in size? So with the seventh edition, the old edition, this is going to be a bad cancer. We have a bunch of lymph nodes, and this is going to be a stage four. That's that highest cancer. That's bad, right? Here's the trick. We just changed from the seventh version to the eighth version. And we were all supposed to be using it on, July, on January 1st of the next year for the staging in that patient. And there's a big difference now with HPV associated oropharyngeal squames. So we suddenly have these squamous cell carcinomas that are associated with a virus, not the smokers and drinkers that we used to always talk about and think about with a normal keratinizing head and neck squame at that location. So we used to think about the HPV negative squames or keratinizing head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Patients who are smoking and drinking, what we talked about is lower socioeconomic status, usually lower education and more often African-Americans. Over the past five to 10 years, now we have this whole new discussion about HPV positive oral pharyngeal squames. Often these patients are non-smoking, almost always male. They're often from a higher socioeconomic status with higher education and it's more commonly found in whites. So this has really changed the way we think about head and neck cancer. And if you remember, we talked about all those other cancers and kind of their incidence going down. Well, now we have these HPV oral pharyngeal squames that are actually going up. Their incidence is rising. We're having an increasing number of these cases. So as tobacco use has gone down, 
we've seen oropharyngeal carcinomas rates go up. That's really changed the way we think about cancer in these cases. So here's the really weird thing. If this guy had showed up in December before we changed, he's a stage four, very bad. But if he had just waited till January to show up, he's actually HPV positive. So he's only a stage one, that's very good. We know that HPV associated oropharyngeal squames are very sensitive to chemo radiation. It's still cancer, we still wanna treat it and we wanna treat it aggressively, but we know that they're very sensitive to chemo and radiation. So it's kind of changed our management and how we treat these patients. Now we have a lot of different appearances. You remember we talked about well differentiated, moderately or poorly differentiated squames. Here's kind of a solid palatine tonsil squame with a solid lymph node. We can have a lot of different appearances. Sometimes they're both very necrotic. Sometimes it's mixed, solid and, and necrotic in different areas. And that, that may be that well differentiated, moderately or poorly differentiated differentiation of the squamous cell carcinoma. But it doesn't change our management. It does make us a little more suspicious sometimes of local recurrence might be more likely in a patient with a poorly differentiated squame. We're more likely to find lymph nodes. We're more likely to find perineal tumor spread. So we're gonna be a little more careful in those cases. So the, the next case, uh, so we've got a patient who shows up with hoarseness and he had a big smoking history. Now, uh, this is an area that's very hard to evaluate. So I'm at the level of the larynx. This is the thyroid cartilage. This is the cricoid. These are the arytenoids. When I see the cricoid and the arytenoids, I know I'm at the level of the true vocal cords. And sure enough, I just see muscle on both sides. There's a little vocalis ligament and then the thyroid muscle that makes up the cord. We do have a little bit of asymmetry and a little bit of high density here, but you can see how easily you could go past this. This highlights the importance of clinical information. If I'm reading head and neck studies without clinical information, you know, in some ways I'm not just stupid, I might be dangerous. I might be really leading people astray and doing the wrong thing. But I called up these guys and said, yeah, he's got a little exophytic mass on his right cord. And this was a small squamous cell carcinoma at that area. It's very hard to, if you don't have that clinical information, you could go right by this. So if I get studies with no clinical information or it says something really helpful, like rule out abnormality or rule out pathology, I could easily miss this. So the more clinical information I get, the more likely I am to say something helpful to patient care. So this case had a little exophytic lesion. And this is a lesion of the vocal cords. Now we break up the larynx into different parts. Superglottic larynx, that's where we have fat. The glottic larynx is only a couple of millimeters top to bottom. That's just the vocalis ligament, the thyretinoid muscle and the vocalis ligament. So it's just the true vocal cords and everything below that to the bottom of the cricoid, that's subglottic. So superglottic fat, preepiglottic fat, and then paraglottic fat on the top. When you get to the glottic larynx, it's just muscle on both sides of the airway. And when you get to subglottic, you shouldn't see any mucosal thickening on the inside of the cricoid. So it's nothing or air. So fat, superglottic, muscle, glottic, nothing or air, that's subglottic on the inner ring of the cricoid. The trick here is with the TNM staging, we bring in function to the equation. T1, normal cord mobility. T2, impaired cord mobility, or T3, fixed cord. I may not always know if the cord is fixed or not. And this is one of the arguments people use when they say there's no point in me putting a radiologic TNM stage in every report, because I don't know if the cords are moving or not. So if we have a little uh, lesion exophytic on one cord, that's a T1A, it's a little lesion. Now the vocal cords themselves are lymphatic poor and uh, vascular poor. So they're much less likely to show up with a lymph node. So we usually don't image these. The surgeon sees it, they scope it, and they laser the lesion and they're done. That's it for that lesion. Uh, so this, for example, is a small T1A if it's just on one cord and doesn't cross midline. If it crosses midline, that's automatically a T1B. So here's an example where the anterior commissure is too thick. That anterior commissure should just be a millimeter. It should just be very thin. So if it's too thick, we think about tumor crossing over. And again, you see a little bit of higher density here. We see the sclerotic arytenoid on the side. We used to think if the thyroid cartilage was sclerotic, it meant it was invaded by tumor. We know that's not true anymore. There's kind of a periclastic reaction that sometimes happens. 
but we're looking at dual source as well as MR with ADC imaging and DCE to try to figure out subtle thyroid cartilage invasion by tumor. That might be a big deal to the surgeons thinking they have to do a total laryngectomy rather than a voice preservation surgery. Now, if it's really big and that cord is a little bit limited motion, that's automatically a T2. Uh, so here's an MR where we lose the fat on that side uh, and we're going down to the vocal cords at that level. So that was a T2 if the vocal cord motion is impaired. If the vocal cord is fixed, that's automatically a T3 if there's a big tumor around that area. And if it's invading that cartilage and escaping the larynx, if it's going all the way through that thyroid cartilage, that's automatically a T4A, it's a big tumor. And if it goes out laterally and surrounds the carotid, that's automatically a T4B. That's the highest stage you can get. So that was a very small lesion, but I don't know if the cords are moving. Even if it's very small, if that cord is fixed, it's automatically a T3 in that case. So when we have skin squamous cell carcinoma, we think more about perineal tumor spread, but also nodes. For example, the parotid might have 50 to 60 lymph nodes within it, and the parotid is the first nodal order drainage station of the penna of the ear and the periauricular skin. So if you have a patient who you knew had a squame on their ear, and two years later they show up with a parotid mass, think about those parotid lymph nodes at that location. Now, extranodal extension or extracapsular spread is something that's uh, sometimes hard to evaluate. If we see fuzziness around the outside or it looks like it's invading the sternocleidomastoid or the SC uh, submandibular gland, we think about extranodal extension. It turns out with HPV patients, there's a little irritating reaction around the lymph nodes. So the fat may look fuzzy, but it may not actually be extranodal extension if it's an HPV positive case. And we also want to remember metastatic disease. So vertebral bodies are great nidises for things like tumor or infection. Uh, so remember that somewhere around 10 to 15% of these head and neck cancer patients may have distant mets, mets below the clavicle. So we want to at least get a CT of the chest if we're not doing whole body PET CT to evaluate those patients. So that's kind of a quick run through of head and neck cancer. We have all these complicated anatomic areas. Each one, you can get into this minute detail about the little anatomy. You could talk about each of those subunits for about an hour, but in big picture with head and neck cancer, we're almost always talking about squame and we wanna always think about those three things. Where is the lesion centered? Where does it go? Does it cross midline? Does it invade bone? Does it invade muscle? We wanna look for lymph nodes. Is there regional lymph nodes? Almost half of those cases may have a positive lymph node somewhere on that case. And we wanna look for perineal tumor spread. If that patient has perineal tumor spread that's crawling all the way back and touching the pons, he's probably not a very good surgical candidate anymore. And it's hard to palpate perineal tumor spread going back to the pons. And it's not like the patient will have obvious symptoms. It turns out perineal tumor spread symptoms are often masked by the primary tumor symptoms. So you can't rely on the clinical evaluation to decide if the guy's got perineal tumor spread or not. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour through head and neck cancer. It's just kind of my deep thoughts about head and neck cancer and how I think about those areas. So try to remember those big things. We have all these big subunits. Think about where the lesion is centered. Where does it go? What does it invade? Look for lymph nodes and look for perineural tumor spread every time you have a head and neck cancer. And I thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for that lecture. Thank you. Very, very thorough and uh, well organized. I appreciate it. And um, we have people from all over, over 100 participants watching too. They thank you all. Um, I'm going to go over a few, few questions that we've had for you. Um, one of the questions from Enrique Mainero is Do you recommend MRI or CT uh, to study the tumors of the head and neck? And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe like, yeah, like, like a lot of things, it varies by site. If you don't have an MRI scanner, that makes it a lot easier. Some people, just as a knee jerk, will do MRI suprahyoid and do CT infrahyoid. We used to worry about thyroid cancer. If somebody's got differentiated thyroid carcinoma, we'd worry about giving them contrast. But I go ahead and give them contrast anyway for two, two important reasons. One, nobody's ever shown, shown a change in M&M &M 
by delaying radionuclide therapy for differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And two, all the biopharmacinetics, the research that was done and how fast the thyroid takes up iodinated contrast, it was actually all done in normal patients. Nobody actually knows the research on disease patients with differentiated thyroid carcinoma. So uh, 30 years ago, I was always told never to give contrast to thyroid cancer, but we go ahead and give it to everybody now because it, it helps with the anatomy so much, especially in patients like with thyroid cancer, if they're, they're coughing or they're having trouble with swallowing, some of these patients have those problems and they can't hold still for 30 minute MR. For a CT, you can zip through the whole body in about 12 seconds and get pretty good pictures. Uh, so I sometimes do CT and MR. If it's something of the face, a lot of people just as a knee jerk will do MR, superhyoid and CT with contrast infrahyoid. Uh, I think again, if you know the anatomy and pay attention to where there's air and where there's fat, you can usually get the right answer with either one but usually it's whichever, whichever one you're more comfortable with. Uh, we do a lot of CT, except for complicated stuff around the face than when we're often doing an MR, especially if we, we think that perineal tumor spread might change the guy's therapy or outcome, then I'm gonna think about doing a contrasted MR. Great. Um, I do have a question about, uh, in regards to the perineal tumor, peri, uh, tumor spread. Um, you know, sometimes when we're protocoling these studies, we want to get an MRI of the face, and this is going to be the distal portion, but, you know, you mentioned, too, you, you want to get the origin of it. Is that going to be like a separate MRI brain protocol or at this cerebral palsy angle protocol? No, for almost everything, you know, an MRI of the face, you're going to start behind the pontomedullary junction and go out through the face, so you usually covered it. So I, I try to combine those so we're not charging them twice if you're in, in a world that cares about that. If you're at the VA in our world of the US, maybe you don't care about time or money, just scan everything and give everybody contract. Uh, but we, we try to combine it whenever we can uh, to evaluate those areas. So usually you could include the areas of interest and it is annoying, but if you have the time and energy to go actually check the study uh, on the scanner while it's being done, sometimes you can add a couple of thin sequences or a bigger field of view to be sure you cover the area of interest. Here we have another question is, what is the ideal interval period for follow-up for post-op cases that would point to tumor recurrence rather than post-surgical enhancement? Uh, well, the, the whole idea of imaging surveillance is a whole other thing in a big world. Usually the surgeons with head and neck cancer patients have a set routine. So they, they, they evaluate the patient immediately post-op and then maybe at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and then increasingly they'll bring the patient in and they just scope them and they look very closely at the site. And maybe at six months, we're gonna think about maybe getting three months or six months, maybe you get that baseline study if you're interested in that. The biggest thing there is red flags. So if they have increasing pain, a new cranial nerve deficit, uh, you know, a new pain, a new cranial nerve that's out, deep face pain or something like that, that's all something that's gonna up your imaging surveillance spectrum. But usually somewhere around three months, most of the, the, uh, the post-operative changes have evolved to a point where you can kind of think about a baseline. And sometimes those are very confusing, especially if you have big flaps that are brought up from somewhere else. If it's a rotation flap or a vascularized free flap like a radial forearm that's brought up from somewhere else like a hemiglossectomy. If you uh, uh, image that immediately pre-op, it can be very confusing. Just like imaging a spine, somebody who's got a disc, they do surgery on it. If you image them right away within a couple of weeks, it'll look like it's worse. And it'll look like they missed the protrusion or they missed the disc. So you don't want to image somebody immediately post-op for a degenerative spine case. So probably about three months to six months, most of the post-operative swelling and edema has gone down to the point where you can think about imaging and getting a baseline scan. Great. Thank you. And here we have uh, one more question from Amal Salanur. Um, brilliant talk, thank you. And uh, the question is, how frequently do you see NPC or nasal pharyngeal carcinoma in, in pediatric patients? Uh, not that often, but again, that's a weird virus thing. Nasal pharyngeal is its whole on discussion. And uh, we, we have these EBV associated nasal pharyngeal squames. Uh, if you pay attention to the WHO, the World Health Organization, 
it seems like every seven years they get together alternating with head and neck or brain tumors. Sometimes they come up with brand new tumors that for some reason didn't exist the year before. Suddenly there's this ART or something else that's a brain. And they reclassify these. Uh, very confusingly, I think with nasopharyngeal carcinoma, we used to have the WHO grade one keratinizing, then the non-keratinizing and then the undifferentiated. Then they tried to figure out how to group these. We used to treat nasopharyngeal carcinomas very differently. So if it was the North American keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, HPV negative, was treated very differently than the Southern Chinese HPV positive, uh, sorry, EBV positive, uh, non-keratinizing nasopharyngeal squames. But now we pretty much treat them all the same. I don't see them in my patient population that often in children, but there are some areas, if, if your patient population has that genetic predisposition, uh, Alaskans, Southern Chinese, apparently everybody smokes in China. So Southern Chinese have a lot of EBV, so they see more nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So if you're in Singapore, Southern China, these different areas, you may see a lot of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, even in children. And in my world, I don't see as many in my pediatric population. And so what we'll be doing right now is kind of ending um, to put to an end here. I do want to uh, give a shout out from everyone for you, Dr. Wiggins. Uh, we have people saying hello from Mexico, from Bhutan Dejan, um, as well as from Chile, from Zambia. Um, let's see, uh, Colombia, as well as, um, again, like I mentioned, Mexico as well. Oh, that and, is great. Uh, Good for you. Yeah, so you have reached over 100 people here with your lecture, and we're going to have, record, have this recording available for everybody. Great. And what I do want to do, do one moment is actually share my screen in order to share our uh, current um, holiday PPE Thanksgiving do or PPE donations. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So if you go to our website and open up the, um, go to donate, here we have so far 15, almost uh, just a little bit about 14,000, uh, 30,000 raised for our donations. That's great. In places like um, that need it the most locally as well as globally. So we all appreciate um, any of your donations. And again, this is a, um, uh, Section 501c3, which is tax, tax deductible in the US. Okay, and um, there is anything else I want to thanks again for Dr. Wiggins for joining us this morning. And thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thank for, you. Uh,